to consider um, as we look at them together, um, particularly what they, what, what they teach us that the believing life looks like. Um, what does it look like in practice? What is the attitude of the believer? What does repentance <coughs> look like in practice, particularly um, as we consider um, the Lord's table tomorrow and um, as we call these preparatory services, as the customs come down to us, um, I want to look with you and ask this question. What does a believing life look like? What did Jesus say it looked like? What should our lives look like? Well, I began reading in Matthew chapter 4, um, and uh, I wanted to read that chapter to set a little bit of context, and I want to look at that with you first of all, uh, really uh, also to explain to you why I'm taking an overview of these things um, here. Uh, but, uh, there from Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12 onwards, uh, we read about this beginning of our Lord Jesus Christ's preaching ministry. Um, verse 17, <coughs> after the death of, uh, after John the Baptist had been put into prison, John of course was, had been preaching and baptising, and our Lord had been baptising with his disciples, um, but he got taken into prison. And after that, there was a significance. After that, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ went into Galilee. And from verse 17, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there was all sorts of power that went along with that preaching, his healing ministry, of course. But this was the substance of his message. This was what he was preaching. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's a very simple sentence. And it's a very simple message. And we're quite sure that our Lord Jesus, as he went about preaching, that he wasn't merely um, shouting this simple message in the towns, you know, like we have this picture of a town crier and they're just saying one thing as they go about the town ringing their bell. It's just one saying that they've been told to say. Well, our Lord Jesus Christ wasn't merely saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But that was the substance. That was a, a summary, a great summary of, uh, of his message. That was what John preached. Look back a few chapters, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, and it says that when John was preaching the very same thing, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that was the message that the apostles uh, preached. Um, this uh, message of repentance in um, Acts chapter 20. Um, we uh, read there a summary, another summary given of the gospel message, repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. That was what they preached, um, the apostles. And that's the message that is preached to the very end of the age. Um, our Lord Jesus, in one place, called it, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the earth. He called it the gospel of the kingdom. In Luke's gospel, at the end, uh, he uh, talks about it as the gospel of repentance. He says, repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Um, the gospel is often summarised like that. It's a very simple call. Repent. And believe the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a simple demand. But there's more to it than just a simple statement. It's something that must not just be said <coughs> like that, but it must be preached, it must be expounded, it must be explained. The message itself is detailed, it's filled out, it's authoritative, it's captivating as well. And here at the beginning of our Lord Jesus Christ's preaching ministry where he tells us that 
This was the substance of the message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Matthew, in his gospel, goes on. And he gives us this great, detailed sermon of our Lord Jesus Christ from Matthew chapter 5 onwards. That we call the Sermon on the Mount. And there is a lot of detail in it. Much more than a, a mere simple statement. And if we were to summarise what this Sermon on the Mount is all about, and there's a lot in it, if we were to summarise it, I would suggest that the, that the detail that we have here is our Lord Jesus Christ expounding, filling out, explaining what repentance means. What does the life of repentance mean? actually look like? Well, read the Sermon on the Mount. That's what the life of repentance looks like. There's lots of do's in it. There's lots of do nots in it. There's blessings in it. As we read here at the beginning, there's an attitude. In these Beatitudes particularly, our Lord is saying, well, this is an attitude that is in a believing person. Repentance. There is a, a danger. Um, well, there's a danger in overcomplicating. And there's always a danger in overcomplicating uh, the gospel. And there's a danger in, in oversimplifying it as well, in having a wrong view of it. Um, there's a danger that we think of repentance as just as, well, it's, we said sorry. We tell children that in Sunday school, that's what repentance is. There's something along these lines. It is a, a saying sorry, a genuine desire to reform. It's not just that we once said sorry to God. It's not that we, um, uh, it's not that we once prayed a prayer, as uh, we sometimes talk about it. He's prayed the prayer or she's prayed the prayer. That in itself is not repentance that's preached in the gospel. It may well be a part of it. It is a part of it. But repentance is this live, ongoing change of life. It's a turning, a constant turning from our sin to newness of life. From going in one direction to going in a different direction. And we need to know what that direction is. We need to know what it looks like. What is it that we're being called to? What is this newness of life? And there's this striving that goes along with it as we strive to meet God's standards. Well, these are the standards in the Sermon on the Mount. I would suggest if we're really to summarise it, if we're to try and say, well, what part of, the, of Jesus' preaching does this fit into? It's repent. Later on in Matthew chapter 13, we have another great block of our Lord's teaching, another sermon on a memorable occasion. That time he went into a boat. There were so many crowds on the shore, he went in a boat and he pushed out a little bit. And then he preached. And we have these parables of the kingdom. He preached all about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like, he said again and again, and gave picture of what the kingdom of heaven is like. Well, if we were to summarise that and fit it into this um, summary that Matthew gives us, well, that's the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our Lord Jesus went on and explained these things in detail. That's not just a simple statement either. But here, um, this great block of teaching that we have, Matthew 5 through 7, uh, this is about repentance. What does the repentant life look like? We need to constantly come back to these teachings. Well, this evening, having sort of set that context, I, I want to look at, summarise with you, take an overview with you of these, um, of these blessings that our Lord Jesus Christ pronounced. And uh, I do want to suggest and, uh, and affirm that 
here our Lord Jesus Christ is giving a picture of the attitude of a penitent believer. Um, well, we read these blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so on. Our Lord Jesus made all these statements about this blessed person. Um, well, we're not to think, when we look at these statements of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're not to think as if our Lord Jesus Christ is describing lots of different types of people. <coughs> we're not to think that, well, there's some people, and uh, there's some Christians, or there's some believers, and, and they are poor in spirit. And they'll be blessed for being poor in spirit. And there's other believers, and they're the ones that mourn. And they'll be blessed because they mourn. And then there's other believers, and they're the meek ones. And you can see that they're the meek ones, and they'll be blessed because they're the meek ones. We're not to break it down like that. I know it reads a little bit like that, but we're not meant to break it down like that. What our Lord Jesus Christ here is conveying is a standard. Who is the blessed person? Who are the blessed people? Well, they are all these things. We're certainly not to read this list, if you want to call it a list, and, and, and just pick out a few things for ourselves. We're meant to understand that our, our Lord is describing in all these terms a believer. Like in Psalm 1, that man of perfect blessedness, or blessed is that man who doesn't walk astray in the counsel of the ungodly. He's blessed. And it's, he, he is describing his pattern of life. He is the blessed man. Well, here, in all these statements of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's saying, well, the blessed man is also these things. The blessed man is also one who's poor in spirit. He's one who mourns. He's one who's meek. He's one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness' sake. <coughs> Um, these things, all these things are things that we ought to aspire to. Um, they're things uh, that we ought to set as our standards for our life. When we examine ourselves, as we ought to do, not just at these times, of course, but all the time, and regularly, um, well, these are the standards by which we ought to examine ourselves. Do I have this attitude, this repentant attitude that our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Christ describes here as he begins this teaching. Well, let me look at these things with you. Um, we'll take them uh, one by one and I hope we'll have a picture, we'll remind ourselves uh, of, <coughs> of what the believing life is what the Lord expects of us. Blessed, first of all, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, this is a, a New Testament uh, teaching, a New Testament statement of our Lord Jesus Christ, but it's it's also an Old Testament teaching. You look back through the Old Testament and you look at the, uh, the lives of the patriarchs and the believing uh, men and women of God, and <coughs> especially in the Psalms. There's this idea that they convey that they're poor, that they're needy. When they look at themselves, they don't look at themselves like uh, the psalmist in Psalm 74, he says to God, do not forget the life of your poor forever. He's not talking about somebody that's financially poor. He's looking at himself and those around him, the believing community, and he's saying we're poor. There's nothing we can do, Lord. We can't help ourselves. We don't have the strength. And our Lord Jesus Christ 
he's explaining, he's restating, and much of the Sermon on the Mount, he's restating old truths that are eternal truths. And here, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's saying to that believer, somebody that's followed him, and who looks at themselves and examines themselves, and all they see in themselves is, is poverty. They don't look inside and see spiritual riches. They don't look inside and see attainment. And our Lord Jesus Christ said, well, blessed is such a person. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's this spiritual poverty. There are this sense of spiritual poverty. It's a humility. It's a recognition of our own spiritual weakness and our own inability. Uh, we sometimes uh, find ourselves um, We find that we don't have this attitude in ourselves sometimes. You remember the Apostle Peter. And on that occasion, when our Lord, on the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, and Jesus said to them, You will all desert me. All of you will desert me. And Peter <coughs> said, I will never forsake you. I will never desert you. Even if all else deserts you, I will never. And our Lord described it as a willing spirit. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He said of Peter on that night. But Peter in that, when he said these things, he wasn't showing this poverty of spirit. He was looking at himself, wasn't he? And he was saying, I will do it. I myself will stand firm with the Lord. I myself will suffer what I must. I myself will do it. I have the ability. And for that moment, um, Peter thought he was strong. He thought he had a spiritual strength in himself. And you remember that night our Lord Jesus said to them again and again, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. I wonder if they listened. I wonder if they still had that spirit of thought, well, well, we should watch and pray because he's told us to, but I don't think we'll fall into temptation. We'll make sure that we don't. There should have been a fear in Peter when our Lord Jesus said that Satan had asked to sift them. There ought to be a fear in us. A godly fear, and I don't mean a slavish fear, when we know that we also are being sifted sometimes. But the devil at times asks to sift the Lord's people. Um, this, this teaching that our Lord gives, this particular statement, poor in spirit, it's not really a popular one. Um, we live in an age when people talk about empowerment. We, we need to empower <coughs> ourselves. We need to empower people. Um, we need to have self-belief. Those that doubt themselves or doubt their abilities are um, well, that's seen as a very negative thing. You never get anywhere if you doubt, if you mistrust yourself, believe in yourself. But our Lord Jesus Christ is saying spiritual things. Don't believe in yourself. He's looking out and he's seeing these believers that are concerned because they look at themselves and they don't believe in themselves. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. There's this attitude also of being beggars, that we're actually asking God like a beggar. He doesn't have, he can't plan ahead for the future. He just asks people, give me what I need for today. And that's what we're like. That's what we should realize that we're like. We don't have the strength. We don't have it in ourselves to say where we will be left ourselves. 
in the future. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I wonder what you think uh, when if people were to go around saying, well, do you know, the believer is someone who's mourning. They're mourning all the time. There's a, they have a mournful attitude. Well, we might misunderstand the teaching a little bit, but probably instinctively we, we sort of think, well, that's not, that doesn't present well to the world. We're always trying to get rid of this miserable caricature that people have of Christians. What does this mean? Blessed are those who mourn. And it doesn't mean that you're blessed just when something very bad happens to you. There's times when we naturally mourn. But our Lord's not talking about natural mourning when we've had a loss or something like that. He's talking about an attitude out of heart. Um, it's, not a, it's not a misery. It's not a miserableness of our lives. Neither is it a sort of depression, you know, a kind of hopeless mourning where we see all that's black and it all seems hopeless. That's not what our Lord is talking about here. He's talking about um, a, a, a godly mourning. When, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And when he came to the <coughs> climax of his sermon, um, he, uh, he told them that they had crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 37 of chapter 2 it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what do we do? They felt this grief. They'd just been told, you crucified, you murdered the Christ. And they were cut to the heart. They had this grief. What shall we do? It wasn't just a, a hopeless grief. It wasn't just a grief because it had affected them and caused them problems. It was a grief because of the, of the tragedy of what they had done, of the dishonour to the Lord's cause that, that they themselves had been involved in. That's the sort of mourning that our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking about. Not a hopeless mourning, not a, a, a constant attitude of, of miserableness, but the, the, the believer looks out and looks at their own life, looks out at the way the world is, looks at the way the church is often and mourns about it, about the dishonour that's done to the Lord Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 12 and Revelation talk about they'll look on him whom they pierced and they'll mourn. The dishonour that was done, the wrong that was done. Psalm 137 quite familiar to us, that when they've been taken away in captivity, the, the, uh, the people of Israel, uh, or Judah, and they uh, wept when they remembered Zion, they thought of the Lord's city, <coughs> and God's city and God's temple, and it was in tatters. And when they thought of that, they wept, not just because they'd lost their homes, but because of what it meant for the cause of God. Christ mourned over Jerusalem, he wept, remember when he saw him, and when he came towards the end of his ministry, he was weeping because these were the Lord's, these were God's people, and they weren't ready for the day of peace that God had had for them. And there's all these things that we mourn about, uh, we ought to mourn about, and the scripture says uh, here, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's why it's not a, it's not a hopeless mourning. Um, there is a, a day to come when there will no longer 
be dishonour done to Christ and to his cause. And there will no longer be corruption or, uh, or error in the church. It will be perfected and it will be pure. And the people of God will be comforted. Remember Israel when they came back and they rebuilt, began to rebuild their city and their temple. They were comforted. They rejoiced. One day the church of God redeemed you, given Christ, redeemed, perfect. You will be comforted. The old things you won't remember. They were concerned in this age. And the time will come when you will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. I wonder if we have a, a, a true hunger and a thirst in our lives um, for righteousness. We long to see righteousness. You know what it is? When, you, when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, you need food, you need drink, or you'll die. Remember, was it Thomas Chandler who said, give me Scotland, or I die? He wanted to see a righteous commonwealth, even. He wanted to see righteousness. And the Lord's people that look for these things we want to see it. We don't just want to be thought of as righteous. We want to see it. And um, in the book of Malachi, the closing book of the Old Testament, um, these Jews that we, that we read of in, in Malachi, they're very similar to the Jews and the Pharisees that we then read of when we open the New Testament. Not a lot changed. But they had this form of righteousness. They made their sacrifices. They went to the temple. They, they wept when they did their prayers. And uh, they did their prayers and so on. And they did all these things. And Malachi, or God through Malachi, spoke to them and was telling them that they had to repent. And uh, they said, how can we return? How can we come back? They looked at themselves and they didn't see that there was anything wrong. They didn't see the things that God saw, which was that the, the labourers were being oppressed, that the sacrifices that they were offering were weak or miserable sacrifices. They were going through the ritual. They didn't actually thirst and hunger for righteousness. It didn't make sense to them. The scripture gives us this great hope uh, towards the end, 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, we're told about this age to come, the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. We're to hunger and thirst for that righteousness and we will be satisfied. Um, the Lord will himself uh, be dwelling righteously in this new heavens and this new earth with his people. Blessed are the meek. Um, sorry, I skipped. I skipped the meek there. Did it in the wrong order. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When we look at ourselves, do we see a meekness in our lives? Do we have a, 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 this meekness? What does that mean? Um, well, in Psalm 37, actually our Lord is uh, really, he's quoting it here, Psalm 37, it's a psalm <coughs> where the psalmist looks out and he sees the wicked seem to be doing so well. They're flourishing. They're doing all this wickedness and everything's going well for them. And he's, he's tempted to get angry about it. He's tempted to fight against them, to war against them in a carnal, earthly way. And the psalm says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. It's not, a, it's not yours to fight that sort of battle, not in that sort of way. 
And our Lord Jesus reassures the son, saying, the meek will inherit the earth. That's a sort of attitude of meekness, forsake from anger. Forsake anger. Cease from anger, sorry, and forsake wrath. And we're not to be offensive, taking ground by force, aggressive. Our Lord Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world. We're not going to win the kingdom to God by fighting, by arguing, by anger. My citizens would fight, he says, but my kingdom is not of this world. The meek, those who wait uh, meekly for God, they will inherit the earth. <coughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Um, remember the Lord's Prayer. Uh, our Lord gives this clause just in the next chapter. Um, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He tells a parable on one occasion about this unmerciful steward, this unmerciful servant who wouldn't forgive his debtors. We're to be merciful. We're to be forgiving. Um, the world uh, tells us, well, you're not going to get anywhere with that sort of attitude. You can't just forgive people. You can't just let them walk all over you. And sometimes we, we ought not to, and I don't for one moment think Christians should be sort of doormats, they just let everybody walk over them. There's a time to make a stand, yes, but there's a time to be merciful, forgiving. Um, the Lord Jesus says that those who are merciful will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's a particular um, there's a particular element, an aspect of our, of our Christian life that we uh, maybe uh, find easy to neglect. Let's start the pure in heart. Well, nobody can see your heart. Nobody really knows the measures that you put in place in your life to keep your heart pure. We live in a time when we're bombarded with all sorts of things that will corrupt our hearts. Um, blessed are the pure in hearts. True religion is of the heart. And when you're uh, striving for purity in your heart, in your thoughts, in your life, maybe nobody else sees it. But the Lord sees it and he says, blessed are the pure in heart. You will see God Blessed are the peacemakers. I'm going to be a little bit quicker here. Um, blessed are the peacemakers. Some of these things seem like they almost overlap. Um, there's a place for the believer to make peace, to desire peace. Psalm 34, um, seek peace and pursue it, the psalmist says. Um, that was David. That was David when he was being hounded by Saul, who was making a war against him. He was calling him an outlaw and he was driven out of the kingdom. And David was teaching his men, seek peace and pursue it. And he did that. David did that. I'm sure if you remember the stories about David, uh, there was a few occasions when the Ziphites, who were part of the tribe of Judah, his own, his own tribe, the Ziphites, kept reporting on him to Saul. They kept going to Saul and saying, David's here. If you come now, you'll get him. They were informers, they were traitors. But when David took the kingdom, we don't read that he did anything to the Ziphites. He didn't go after them for revenge. What David was thinking of was, what will make for peace in this kingdom? That was what his focus was. Our focus, what will make for peace in the church? Not remembering old rivalries or sins that people have committed against us which easily come to mind later on David did something similar um, there was that incident with Shimei when, when Absalom took the kingdom and uh, was taking the kingdom from David and he had to flee and Shimei followed him and threw stones at him and hurled insults at him and then when he came back 
Shimei was there, very apologetic, and they said to him, execute him. And David said, no, nobody will die this day. Because he was looking for peace. We are to look uh, for the peace of the kingdom. And then our Lord talks about being persecuted for righteousness sake. It's so easy to avoid uh, persecution. It's so easy to think to ourselves, well, there's no benefit in me taking flack on this occasion. What benefit is there going to be to me? I'll pass up this one. I'll, I'll fight another battle. I'll choose my battles. I'll fight another one. When we're persecuted for Jesus' uh, name's sake, well, these words are so encouraging. You're blessed. Blessed are you. And the apostles showed that when they rejoiced, when they were beaten for the name of Christ. They went out rejoicing, rejoicing. I don't think we've got that attitude. Uh, I don't think we have fully understood that attitude. <coughs> and blessed are you when they persecute you. Well, let me conclude. I'm conscious of uh, taking too long. Um, it's an overview. Our Lord Jesus here is, is setting a standard. He's saying, the, this is the attitude that I am looking for in my people. This is the attitude that the Lord's people will find if they look at themselves, as they examine themselves. Um, Sometimes we find it, and sometimes we don't. I'm not drawing these things to your attention this evening to set the bar so high that we all just give up and say, well, I can't live up to that. What our Lord Jesus, he's setting standards. And some people will say, well, what you're preaching is a works religion. You, you can't tell people what to do. People to, you don't just tell people how to live. That's so that's works. Well, it's not works. We're not for one moment saying that if you fail in any of these counts, you're lost. That's not what we're saying. These are Christ's standards. This is what we attain to. This is what we look for in ourselves. If we throw out these standards, if we say they don't matter, it's not that we're preaching grace rather than works. We're throwing out the preaching of repentance. It's part of the gospel message. Repent. This is what it looks like. This is the attitude that Christ requires of us. Well, may the Lord bless these things to us. We join together in prayer.